Good evening and welcome to our 6.30 p.m. Bible study here at Lead Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, we know that you have a number of choices when it comes to your Bible study and that's why we are so glad that you have decided to log on, tune in and have Bible study with us tonight. Uh, we give God praise and glory for your presence here and we simply remind you that today is the day the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. We give God praise and thanksgiving for the opportunity to gather tonight and to study more of his word. As we study more of his word, it allows us to grow spiritually. It allows us to feed our spirits and to grow and to also constrain some of our own uh, desires and walk in that path that God has for us. And that is why I enjoy having Bible study so much. That's why I hope that you also will find some, some meaningful uh, lessons in our Bible study. We have been on a journey in the book of Romans here of late. We have been uh, walking through this particular letter of the, uh, Paul to the Romans and gaining, I believe, some helpful insight in ways that we might live lives better and more pleasing to God. And so I invite you to join with us tonight as we go into Romans chapter number 12. Uh, last week we were in Romans chapter number 11 and gained a good amount of insight. And as we come to Romans chapter number 12, we only have uh, four more chapters after this one. And so I hope that you have gained again some insight from that. If you have missed any of our previous lessons, uh, you can find them on our YouTube page and also on the current Facebook page you're on. Uh, just simply scroll through the videos and you will find our Bible studies for the previous chapters. All right, let us pause now for a word of prayer as we prepare our hearts and minds for our Bible study. Uh, gracious God, we certainly thank you for today. We thank you, God, for the opportunity to study more of your word. We thank you, God, for the opportunity to learn more about ourselves as we journey through your scriptures. Give us grace, O oh God. Reveal to us, Lord, more and more of your word as we study it. This, O oh Lord, is our prayer in your son, Jesus the Christ's name. Amen. All right, Romans chapter number 12 uh, picks up again where we left off with Romans chapter number 11. And just a very brief recap, I will go through uh, where we have been in Romans. We started out with Paul uh, trying to educate this particular group of Christians about the journey that they had been taking uh, and how righteousness and grace and mercy played such an intimate part in their own growth and development. Paul also wanted us to understand that we have all fallen away from God's righteous expectations of us, but that's where grace and mercy come in. Paul also wanted us to understand the importance of our faith and how persons like Abraham uh, lived out their faith by following God's commandments. But more than that, they lived out their faith by trusting God, even when there seemed to be difficulty in their path. Paul also wanted to give an example of the differences between Adam's transgressions and Christ's sacrifice uh, in that Adam transgressed and all of us were unfortunately uh, bound by our sinful nature, but then Christ came and died for our sins, which freed us once and for all from that. Also that we have a chance of new life in Jesus Christ in that as Christ died, our old selves also died. And as he was resurrected, our new selves were resurrected with Jesus Christ. And that's good news because it reminds us and informs us of the fact that we don't have to be stuck in our old ways or old habits, but we can be regenerated and reborn. And of course, uh, we know that uh, Paul also talked about this inner conflict that our spirit is warring with our flesh. And that's why it's so important in tonight's lesson for us to gain understanding of how we can grow and be stronger spiritually to be able to live the life in the spirit that God wants us to live. All right, Paul also talks about the future glory of living with God and how uh, our present day challenges really pale in comparison to that future glory. And of course, Paul talked about the fact that as we grow in Christ, we become more obedient to his word. And that brings us uh, to chapter number 12, where Paul talks about uh, this new life in Jesus Christ. And so I invite you again to join with me as we read verses 1 through 21. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, 
to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body and in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. May the Lord have a blessing to the readers, hearers, and the doers of his holy word. All right, so as we gather every time for Bible study, it is my hope always that we gain some more understanding about the character of God, something more about the human condition, and something more about the particular text that we are reading. And of course, it is my prayer that tonight as we dive into Romans chapter number 12, that we will indeed learn something more about each of those three things. So again, Romans chapter 12, Paul gives us some good information to dig into. We have three questions to ask, but I'll also reference some of the verses that I have not referenced with questions, but I want us to at least get those three questions in and then we'll reference those verses also. So the first question that we have tonight to help us with our journey in Romans chapter 12 is, according to Paul, what does spiritual worship consist of? According to Paul, what does spiritual worship consist of? Now, we use this word worship when we primarily describe uh, either how we corporately worship God, and that can be in our Sunday worship or Saturday worship or any day during the week when we gather corporately and we worship God. Uh, usually at Lee Chapel and some other churches, we'll have a uh, scripture read, we'll have prayer as part of our worship service, we'll have a song sung, uh, we'll have then sermon preached, and that's part of our worship experience. And in that process, we are ascribing worthiness or worthship to God. We are engaged in praying prayers that ascribe worthiness to God. We are reading scriptures that remind us of God's worthiness. We are singing songs that ascribe God's worthiness. And we also may be engaged in preaching and receiving a sermon that also ascribes our worthiness to God. 
in that worship experience when we're ascribing or giving or, or lifting up uh, God's worthiness in our hearts and minds, we are primarily setting aside that time, even though we do it also during the week and other times, but we are just setting aside primarily that time to say, God, you are worthy of our attention. God, you are worthy of our love. God, you are worthy of our praise and our affection. And God, we're going to set aside these few hours to do nothing but focus on praising you. Now, that's corporate worship. Now, you can have individual worship where you uh, decide that you are going to engage maybe in a uh, prayer dialogue with God. Maybe you will sing some songs. Maybe you'll listen to someone singing a song. And in that moment, you are ascribing worthiness to God. You are setting aside time. Also, worship can be described when you engage in activities that set God first in your life. So, for example, if you have a situation that is not necessarily pleasing to you, brought to your attention, maybe somebody uh, come to you with some information and it's not positive information and they want you to know that something negative has happened and they want your response to it. In that moment, you can individually ascribe worthiness to God by reacting and responding in a manner that is consistent with putting God first. In other words, you don't respond by reacting to them and responding in the same manner that they brought you information. So maybe someone raises their voice to you. Maybe someone speaks ill to you. Well, in that moment, you worship God by responding as Jesus would. You worship God by responding out of your divinity and not your humanity. And that's one way we should worship God. And so again, Paul asked the question, uh, according to Paul, right, what does our spiritual worship consist of? Look at verse number one. He says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. So now, here is my body. God, here is my mind. Uh, here is my mouth. Here are my hands. Here are my legs, right? And, and I ought to engage in activities that do what? Activities that are a living sacrifice. Now, what is a sacrifice? A sacrifice can be something that is given out of a desire to worship God. So when Abraham was told by God to go up and sacrifice his son, uh, they were going up there and his son was familiar with what the altar looked like. And the son said, Father, I see the altar. And of course, I see the wood, but where is the sacrifice? And of course, Abraham told his son, listen, God will provide the sacrifice. In other words, God was asking Abraham, I want you to put me before your son. I want you to love me enough to give your son back to me. I want you to sacrifice your son. In other words, give me what you love most. That way, I know that you are putting me first. Parents do this. Parents oftentimes, if they're in an unfortunate financial situation where they maybe can't afford to uh, feed their children and they also get as much to eat, parents may sacrifice and allow their children to have most of the food at dinner or lunchtime or breakfast time and their parents will eat a little bit less. Parents also do this in, when they engage in attending uh, recitals or performances or, or games of their children. They will sacrifice, right, and do that. Parents also sacrifice in working maybe an extra job to be able to earn extra income to provide for their child the clothes that they need. So parents give of their time that's important to them in order to provide for their child, right? And so God says to us, give me your bodies as a living sacrifice. So I'm Harold Love and I don't want to uh, go to church on Sunday. I want to sleep in and give me some rest. Well, what is my sacrifice? My sacrifice is get up, tune into worship, right? Well, maybe on a Saturday, I don't want to engage in some community service activity. I want to stay at home and rest. But God says, well, why don't you sacrifice a little? 
Maybe God has asked you to sacrifice something. Maybe he's asked you to sacrifice responding to somebody in a negative fashion. Though you want to, though it may seem important to you, God says, now sacrifice and instead respond in a positive manner. Sacrifice can also be in a positive way. You may have some time on your hands and God says, sacrifice that time. And do what, God? Well, pick up my word and read it. Spend some time with me. And by doing that, sacrifice some important time that you have with me. Also, God says we should sacrifice our treasure. When Cain and Abel were asked by God to bring to him their first fruits, Abel did, but Cain didn't. God accepted Abel's offering. He did not accept Cain's offering because Cain was not willing to sacrifice and give God of his best. So what are we looking at? God expects us to sacrifice. It says, my brothers and sisters, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Our bodies are holy to God. They should be set aside, which means that I should no longer say certain things to people that I might want to say. I should no longer do certain things that I might otherwise do because now I got to sacrifice and that is my spiritual worship. Second thing that Paul asks is this, or second question rather, according to Paul, how do we transform ourselves? This is going to help us in offering our bodies as a living sacrifice. Verse 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So now here I am on a journey trying to figure out what is God's will for my life? What does God want me to do? What has God created me uniquely to do? What gifts has God placed inside of me? What skills has God equipped me with that can benefit his kingdom building? Well, in order for me to hear God's voice and know God's will, I got to transform my ears. My ears cannot be conformed to this world, right? So I got to cast out some things. I got to block my ears from hearing some things. So I also have to renew my mind. Every day I got to make my mind new again, renew, right? I got to make my mind, you have to make your mind new every day. Well, how do we do that? We renew our minds, right? And we're transformed by the renewing of our minds by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is able to renew our minds. And I touched on much, much of this Sunday with the sermon about living in the Spirit and about how the Holy Spirit can allow us, like those dry bones, to bring back to us what life has separated. The Holy Spirit can allow us to live again Right? The Holy Spirit can empower us to walk in the path that God has for us. And so now we understand that we can do this. I can have my mind new because here's what happens. Every day we're dealing with things coming into our minds, through our eyes, through our ears, our perception of things. And what happens oftentimes is our mind gets cluttered. Anybody remember uh, there was a time in school where we had an old, well, a chalkboard. I think now they have these dry erase boards, but it's the same concept. When it's clean and nothing on it, you have plenty of space to write a lot of stuff on it. You can write notes from all the chapters, you can do math equations, you can do scientific explanations, you can write uh, letters on there, right? You can write paragraphs. But once it starts getting filled, there's not much space to put anything else on that chalkboard or dry erase. And I remember as a child, the teacher would start on one end and would write to the other end and would say, listen, take your notes and write this down because now I got to erase the chalkboard so I can put something else on there. Well, every time that the teacher erased that chalkboard, what was on there previously was gone. Now, if you remember like I did, sometimes erasing the board didn't get it completely clean, but it did get it cleared. And oftentimes the teacher would do what? Go behind and take some water with a rag and wash the chalkboard. 
And with the dry erase markers, even now, they leave some residue behind. And the teacher will go behind, spray something on there, and wipe down, wipe down that board to clean it, make it new again. As the teacher makes that board new, what is new now can receive what's next. And so every day God asks us to renew or clean our minds so that we can know what? So we can know what is the will of God. What is good and acceptable and perfect. So in order for me to give my life and my body as living sacrifice, I got to know what God's will is for me. I have to know what is good and acceptable and perfect. So if God says, I want you to give this to me, and I don't understand that, and instead I give God this, that's not what God asked for. God asked for this. Well, they're both bound with paper on the inside. Yeah, but they're different. These are hymns. This is the Bible, right? And so oftentimes we confuse things and give God a part of what he's asking, but not fully what he's asking. But we can give God all that he asks once we know what his will is. And his will is not hard to discern. We just have to renew our minds and be transformed, made new every day so we can hear what God's will is. Now, before I get to the third question, I do want to go through some of these verses. Paul also teaches us something very important about cooperating within God's body. Let me be very clear. This is God's church. And every worship center across the world that claims to be uh, God's church is also God's church. So if you claim to be God's church and you're going to live by God's rules, you have to abide by God's rules. And one of God's rules is this. Since this is God's church, I'm not in charge. Since this is God's church, you're not in charge. Since this is God's church, Christ is in charge. We are just simply operating in positions that he has assigned to us in a cooperative manner to make God's church function better. Well, how is God's church supposed to function better? Look at verse number four. For as in one body, we have many members. So here's my body. One member is my hand. Another member is my arm. Another member is my leg. Another member is my brain and my head. Another member is my neck, right? Another member is my feet. Those are different members of my body. Inside of my body, also different members. There's a heart, there are lungs, there are kidneys, there's a spleen, there's an appendix, there's a stomach, right? There's intestines. Those are also members in that same body. But look at what Paul says. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So the heart does not function like the brain. The hands don't function like the feet. The legs don't function like the hips. The intestines don't function like the stomach. So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually we are members one of another. So all of my organs are all part of my body. All of my extremities are all part of my body. All of my other parts, my eyes, my ears, all part of my one body, and they have to cooperate in order for me to function properly. If my heart stops functioning properly, I'm in trouble. If my lungs stop functioning properly, I'm in trouble. So the heart can say, y'all need me more than anything else. So act right, well, I'm gonna stop functioning. Well, heart, if you stop functioning and stop pumping blood, then what's gonna happen is the lungs can't bring in oxygen, which then helps keep you alive. The heart can't say, I'm gonna keep all the blood to me and I'm gonna starve y'all out if y'all don't do right. Well, the blood will soon be oxygen deprived and will require the lungs to expand and contract to bring in oxygen and push out carbon dioxide. So now the heart needs the lungs. 
The lungs can't say, if y'all act right, I'm not going to push in air. I'm going to keep all the air to me. Well, soon the lungs will need blood to stay alive and they need the heart. You get the picture, right? We all need each other and must cooperate in a function that makes our existence profitable to the body. Because if the lungs stop functioning, guess what? I'm going to have to get a lung transplant to put in lungs that will function. If the heart stops functioning, I'm going to have to get a heart transplant to put a heart in that will function. And that's what we must understand. We are all necessary to each other. And we must cooperate in order to make our functioning profitable to Christ's body. All right? Notice what it also says. Individually, we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. We are members one of another. So you are a member of someone else's body in this church and whatever church you attend. And they are members of your body. So if they do you harm, they're doing harm to themselves. If they don't cooperate with you, they're not cooperating with themselves, right? We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Everybody has different gifts, but everybody can serve the same God. All right? Third question here. According to Paul, how does God want us to live with each other? Wow, how does God want us to live with each other? Look at verse number 18. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. That right there is the key also to verses number one and two. How do I offer living sacrifice to God? I live peaceably with everybody. How do I not be conformed to this world, but yet be transformed by the renewing of my mind? I live peaceably with everybody. How do I view everybody as part of me? I live peaceably with everybody. Those three things. God has empowered all of us to live peaceably with each other as far as it depends on us. You can have somebody who has issue with you. It doesn't mean you have to have issue with them. And God will empower you if you let him to live peaceably with other folks who don't even like you. Because you don't have to return to them what they give to you. You don't have to give back to them what they give to you. If they look at you crazy, look at them in peace. You don't have to return evil for evil, but overcome evil with good. And when God gives us this instruction, it's because God says, I know you can be better. And God is saying to you, I know you can live a better life because I know you can renew your mind. I know you can offer your body's living sacrifice because guess what? Our mouths are part of our body. So don't say things like what they say to you. What does Paul say about that? Paul says that we should bless those who persecute you. Ooh, verse 14. That's a tough one for some folks. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Wow. Not even in your mind. God gives us instruction for us to live a life that is well pleasing to him. And I hope that you have gleaned something from this. Certainly about the character of God, God wants us to live the best life we can. And God is empowering us with the Holy Spirit to live that best life. Something also about the human condition. God knows that we struggle with these things. That's why he says, in as far as it depends on you, live peaceably. You can't affect how peaceably somebody will live with you, but you can affect how peaceably you live with them. If you know that somebody has an issue with you, then maybe you don't go out of your way to engage them, right? Maybe you just speak and move on, or maybe you just, you know, go about your way, live peaceably, right? And if they do speak, then you speak back. Don't not speak because you thought they were mad at you and they didn't speak to you at the last time. Live peaceably. And then finally, something more about the particular text that we are reading. This particular text reminds us that we are all part of the same body. We're all in this together. And we have to function properly with each other 
in order for God's kingdom and God's body to be successful. All right? Well, listen, I certainly hope that you have learned something uh, from Romans chapter number 12, verses 1 through 21. And again, we invite you to tune in to our Sunday worship service at 10 o'clock. We certainly invite you to uh, log on to our church school on this Saturday. And we encourage you to continue to walk by faith and not by sight. Until next time, it is my hope and my prayer that God will continue to bless you. Amen.